certain things with us that God revealed to me while the worship was on. One of the things that I didn't reveal, I was just reminded of now, and I believe it's time for it to be revealed. There might have been somebody here now who wasn't, who needed to hear that in the flesh. I was there and I saw a man that was climbing a ladder. He was climbing the ladder and he was going up and the enemy started to shake the ladder. And then the man himself started getting shaken by the activity of Satan. I knew it was Satan trying to shake up the ladder. And you know what happened? What I realized suddenly was the Lord whispered to the man and said to the man, the ladder is for you, but that's not what's lifting you. Look at me. And what happened was, as the man was rising, even though it appeared he was climbing the ladder, it was in fact the hand of God that was pulling him up. And so I want to encourage you, whatever it is that you're doing to get closer to God, is not what is actually getting you closer. This is what the Lord says. He says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. The activities and the engagements of the natural are there to help your faith, are there to help you steady, to stay steady. But that is not what is lifting you. So do not shortchange your divine experiences in God because you're looking for God to show up to the measure of your readiness. When you haven't prayed as you prayed yesterday, do not shortchange yourself by not listening out for God today. Saying, well, how will God speak to me today when I've been busy running around? I tell you what, you had an opportunity to get on the ladder to help your mind, but in reality, it is the grace of God that lifts you up. And so let the devil shake the ladder all at once. We know that the hand of God never fails and is never short. The hand of God is long enough to reach you where you're at. Imagine where you were coming from and the hand of God found you. So that hand of God that found you while you were lost in your addiction, that hand of God that found you where you were buried in guilt, do you think that hand of God has now become short? He can still pull you closer to himself. And so the latter is one thing. In fact, let me explain this to the people that may not have heard me say this before. Many years ago, I was in a public, I was some, in some public transportation, might have been a van or a bus. I was heading back to my university at the time and I fell asleep and I saw myself having a conversation with God. And he said, I know you want to ask me the difference between reason and purpose. I was like, well, you already know. So what is the difference between reason and purpose? Well, you may be seated, thank you very much. I'm glad you took the initiative. You know, oh yeah. And the Lord said to me, he said, reasons belong to you. He says, but purpose is of the Lord. And I gave you an example that for example, I gave you an example that you may have come here today because if you didn't come, someone at church will text you and you will not have any excuse. So the reason why you came is because you don't want anybody to bother you or you don't want anyone to think that you're backsliding. That's why you came. No, I'm just saying that that may be the reason, right? But then on getting here, the word of God begins to examine your heart and reveal that which the Lord has for you. And then transformation begins to happen in your heart. If I let me give you an example that many people can relate to, especially on a Tuesday like this, you may have come because of the jollof rice. That might be the reason. Okay, the people who come for the jollof rice are not here today. All of you came for Jesus. Praise God. But before you started coming for the Lord, you may have come because, man, I don't want to be at home by myself. I'm going for the rice. That is the reason you gave yourself. But then on getting here, the Lord sends Manuel Lida to come and pray and prophesy over you. And then there you are, shaken by the power of God and thinking to yourself, oh my God, I only came for the rice. The reason you gave yourself for leaving the house is important to you because sometimes the purpose and the mind of God is too high for us to comprehend. If God had told you that he had a word for you and he was going to be man and leader, you might have said, well, I don't even want to be prophesied over. And so the Lord saves the purpose for himself and gives you a reason that you can relate with. 
but your reason will never supersede the purpose in the mind of God. And if you're wondering where that is in scripture, the Bible says that many are the devices in the heart of a man, but only the counsel of the Lord shall stand. Your devices, your reasons, your conclusions, and your assumptions are sometimes instrumental toward revealing what is the purpose that is in the mind of God. And so I want you to take that ladder as a reason that you may have given yourself to pray, to fast, to study the word. Do you know sometimes we pray and fast because of problems in our lives that we want to resolve? Whereas those problems were there as a way of waking you up to pray so that you can hear the love beat of your father's heart. You were saying, Rosemary? Say one more time. Oh yeah, you can sit down, praise the Lord. God is good. Oh yeah, I just, it's always awesome when everybody's standing. God is good. If I, what we're going to do is we're going to sit down for a moment, but I want us to pray. And so if you could just play along with me as we pray, we're just going to pray very quickly from the book of Jeremiah chapter 12 verse 7. And um, hallelujah. We want to pray. We want to begin by praying tonight. Uh, because men ought always to pray and not to faint. So here is what it says. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter uh, 12 verse 7 it says I have forsaken my house I have left my heritage I have give, given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies my heritage to me is like a lion in the forest it cries out against me therefore I have hated it my heritage is to me like a speckled vulture. The vultures all around are against her. Come, assemble all of the beasts of the field and bring them to devour. Now let me just give you a little backstory here of what was going on in the mind of God so you can see the reason why the Lord was saying these things to Jeremiah. In verse 5, Jeremiah says, If you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you, then how can you contend with horses? And if in the land of peace in which you trusted, they wearied you, then how will you join in the floodplain of the Jordan? For even your brothers, the house of your father, even they have dealt treacherously with you. Yes, they have called a multitude after you. Do not believe them, even though they speak smooth words to you. Now this is all sounding like doom and gloom. Like wait a minute, at first the brother stunned against us and now even the Lord is saying that he's not even interested in his heritage. And it's like, if the Lord is no longer interested in his heritage, then are we not all together doomed? It gets even better. Verse 10, many rulers have destroyed my, vine my vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. They have made it desolate. Desolate it mourns to me. The whole land is made desolate because no one takes it to heart. The plunderers have come on all the desolate heights in the wilderness. For the word, word of the Lord shall devour from one end of the land to the other end of the land. No flesh shall have peace. They have sown wheat but reaped thorns. They have put themselves to pain, but do not profit. So all those people that say no pain, no gain, there are times when you have pain and yet no gain. Yeah, ask the person who's been trying to lose weight. But be ashamed of your harvest because of the fierce anger of the Lord. <laughs> so, I would first of all like us to pray giving glory to God. You see, before we rise up to pray, I want to tell you exactly one of the things that we need to be very mindful of. Satan is like those people who say that there is no bad publicity. Every publicity is good publicity. Right? And you see the way that plays out in our world today? People would have on wholesome videos of them with somebody else get leaked on social media and then they become millionaires in the process. 
Some people have become famous in our world today that some of the younger generation have idolized and worshipped simply because things that were publicized about them were evil, but in the world today, there is no bad publicity. As long as your name gets out there, you're going to get something for it. It is called the pay of the harlot. And so Satan is the one that is the lord of the system and that is what he does. It doesn't matter whether you give him glory as though you think he is God or you give him glory as though he is Satan. One way or the other, as long as you give him credit, he is fed. Satan lives off of the credit that we give to him. So for example, somebody comes at you and says, Shayla, why did you do that? And because you're afraid of them, you tell a lie. And then afterwards, you're like, oh God, I'm sorry, it was Satan. Satan is like, I'll take it. Even though it was you, but if you want to give me the credit for it, I will take it. You know why Satan will take it? Because as long as you're blaming Satan for it, you will never present yourself to the Lord for a fixing. You will continually say, God, fix Satan. And Satan is like, he knows he's unfixable. So as long as you're praying wrong, Satan is happy because the reason why he exists is so that you don't make it. So you see the mentality of Satan. This is the reason why the Bible says do not be ignorant of the devices of Satan because Satan will allow for you to blame him for the things that God is doing. A lot of people in the weeks to come, in the months to come, we blame Satan and the Luciferians for the things that will happen on earth. Whereas the Lord says, it is me who is doing it because of my fierce anger. But if we don't know that these are the words of God, not of Lucifer, we will not give the glory to God. The Bible says all glory, all honor, all power belongs to God because it was he who made all things for his pleasure they are and were created and so we must not fall for the temptation of taking God's praise and giving it to somebody else let us stop giving these satanic stooges too much credit because the Bible says who is he that says a thing and it comes to pass when the Lord himself has not ordained it there was a time that somebody in this nation, a very prominent figure in the nation, for almost two years, kept on coming on television every day, lying to us, spreading the rumors of war. And people hated him for it. And when the Lord revealed to me what was really going on, what did I do? I came here. We were still at the basement. And I kept telling you, do not judge anybody. Because some of these people that are operating in the media, they're not falling angels. They are straight up angels doing the bidding of God, setting tests for people. And I reminded you that there was a time in the Bible that the word of God says that a lying spirit departed from the presence of God. Did you read what happened before then? God said, we need somebody to go and confuse the council or defeat the council of Haithophel because as long as Haithophel's council is respected, David was going to be in trouble. And guess who was summoned? To the presence of the Almighty God, a lying spirit. Do you know one of the spirits that goes in and out of God's presence? That many of us even don't like to comprehend? The spirit of death. When the spirit of death came to slaughter the firstborn children in Egypt, what was he called? How was he introduced? He was introduced as the angel of the Lord, the angel of death. But here we are, anything that looks bad, we give the credit to Satan. And so Satan wants to encourage more bad stuff so that your prayers are amazed. So what, what we're going to do right now is we're going to pray. And I want our prayer to be, Lord, open our eyes that we may see your hand. Because as long as you see the hand of God in the water, no matter how turbulent things get, you will stay confident because your father is the one that is stirring the waters. So if you would rise up with me and pray this because this is a prayer against deception.
a prayer that says my heart will not be deceived I would lift up my voice if I were you at this time and say Lord let me not give credit to the enemy let me not give glory to unseen forces that are not of you but let me give all the glory to you because you are the cause and the effect of life you are the beginning and the end the author and the finisher of our faith you are the one that sits in the heavens and yet you rule over all the affairs of men let all the glory be yours from my heart and through my lips to you O most high God no matter what happens in this world I will not curse you I will not blame you I will not give glory to the enemy I will not blame the enemy but I will give you thanks because your hand is at work to bring your judgment upon the earth that you may establish justice in this realm father in the mighty name of Jesus I pray that my heart will be immune to the deceit and the strategies and the schemes of Satan so that no matter what hand the enemy deals I will see your hand and not be fooled by the slight of hand of Satan no matter what the enemy is doing no matter how well they cloak no matter what smokes they blow I will not fall for their tactics and for their antics but I will always give you glory because I know your precepts I know your statutes so the ancient cannot fool me because I know the ancient of days father in the mighty name of Jesus we thank you because our hearts are before you today help us Lord to say it like Jesus said into your hand I commit my spirit in the mighty name of Jesus praise the Lord Oh, give him praise, give him thanks. He is worthy of the praise. Only he is worthy of the glory. Only he is worthy of the honor. Give him praise, give him praise, give him praise. Oh, I'm not a little bit of a man, my son, and I'm not a little bit of a man, 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 Jesus is the Lord, he is the Lord of Lords. Hey, Yabarosa, Mama Kura Bakale Dori Yalamaga Sidari Yalamo, Holy Ghost, in my name, guide me, lead me, let me see your hand, let me see the move that you make, take all the glory, Jesus, take all the glory, Jesus, hallelujah, praise the Lord. We're going to say one more prayer. And this is the prayer of activation. That first prayer was the prayer of, of immunization. To have your heart immune to deceit. But the Lord's been bringing to my attention lately that he will not do this alone. The Lord is not going to do this alone. He's not interested in doing this alone. He's made it clear again and again and again. Everything that God has done, particularly through the sacrifice of Jesus that brought us the empowering and the enabling grace of the Son of Man, is so that you can stand as his co-laborers. And I'm going to show you a couple of things in a moment. But I want to first of all say this prayer of activation. Maboros Holy Ghost. Alrighty. We will do a couple of things first and then we're going to pray. So please be seated. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. We'll save that other prayer for later. Maybe when these guys come up in the end. I am excited because one of the things that the Lord's been schooling me on lately is to focus less on fighting my weakness and focus more on fighting with his strength. Because many of us are not moving simply because we're too heavy in the spirit. We're too weighed down by infirmity by weakness, by shortcoming, by the cares of life, 
We are weighed down by the animal and we're not letting the spirit fly. <laughs> and so here is the deal. We focus so much on what we can do by our own abilities. And when we see that our strength is not enough, then we conclude that our God is not enough. Many years ago, I was standing on the side of the road completely frustrated with myself because the things that I willed to do, I wasn't doing, but the things that I wasn't interested in doing were the things that I was practicing and I was getting better at it. Because you know, practice makes better. Practice does not make you perfect. Only Jesus can make you perfect. Practice can make you better at whatever it is you're practicing. Which is a dilemma because when you're supposed to be growing in the things of God and getting to rise higher in the cadre of the spirit, your flesh gets better at terrible things. And so I stood on the side of the road completely frustrated at myself. And you know what the Lord said to me? He said to me, by strength shall no man prevail. I was like, we need to talk about that for a moment. He says, let's go. I said, by strength shall no man prevail. I said, I get it. I will not prevail by my strength. I will prevail by your strength. He said, we're on the same page. Then he asked me this question. He said, so why are you worried about weakness? What is weakness? Lack of strength, right? So basically, if strength is not in the equation of your fulfilling of destiny, then its magnitude is immaterial. Let's do a little math here, right? When you are about to calculate the area of any shape, so let's take, for example, this television. Let's say that this television is 75 inches long and 65 inches high. If I let's use numbers that we can easily multiply. Let's say that it is 80 inches long and 60 inches high and you want to calculate the area of that television. What do you need? You need just the length and the breadth. Length times breadth gives you 480 inches squared, correct? So that is the area of this television. You multiply the length, which is 60, by the breadth, which is 80. What do you get? I believe it's 480 if you multiply 60 by 80, or 4,800 perhaps. Yeah, yeah, whatever it is. It's not a math lesson. It's just an illustration. Because I noticed that some people are taking me too seriously here. Oh yeah, because six times eight is 48. And they both have zeros, so that's two zeros. That is 4,800. That is 4,800 square meters or inches. And are we happy now? Okay, very good. And then I saw Laura in the back. I'm like, there's even a school teacher here. What am I doing? So now let me tell you, did we need the weight of that television? We did not require the weight of the television to calculate its area. And so whether the weight is minus four or four million, does it matter? No, it is not in the equation because the equation for calculating the area of a shape like that is, is what? A is calculated by L times B. Are you tracking? Did we need to know the weight of that thing? No. And so the Lord is saying that by strength you will not prevail your victory, the equation for your victory is not inclusive of your own strength. What I need from you is obedience, submission, and appreciation of what Jesus has already done. And so why are you now worrying yourself? It's just like if somebody comes, if Laura goes to her students and says, well, I need you to calculate the area and you find a child chewing on his pen and the teacher says, why are you doing that? And it's like, I'm waiting for you to give me the weight. And she's like, if I knew that you needed the weight, I would have given to you the weight. You see, many of us are waiting until God gives us strength to go and do the will of God. 
Whereas it is while you do the will of God that you have strength. Because whenever you do the will of God, God gets pleasure. For every action, there is always an equal but opposite reaction. So in the direction of God, there is pleasure. Every time pleasure comes to God, what comes to you? Joy. The Bible says in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, pleasures forevermore. At the right hand, pleasure. On the other side, what do you have? Joy. So when you have that joy, it gives you strength. So stop waiting for strength to approach the fulfillment of the will of God for your life because it is in the process of fulfilling his will that he gets pleasure and you get the joy. I'm saying all of that because God is dishing out an invitation today that is going to be followed by an activation. All of the things that God is about to do on the earth requires for you and I to voice out the will of God. Because the way God partners with man is that all of what God wants to do, God has already declared by the word of his power, but it doesn't get established until we agree with him in saying it. The Bible says there are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. But there are three also that bear witness on the earth, even though two of them act as one. And what are the three things that bear witness on the earth? The Bible says the water, the spirit, and the word. You are the water. You are the one that comes out of water. But the spirit comes from above. That's why Jesus says the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. And so at the end of the day, after God has given his word, he expects for you, he gave us his word by his spirit, he expects for you to engage his Holy Spirit and say what the spirit is saying and those three will bear witness to what has already been born witness to in heaven and it will happen. That is why God says, let the weak say that I am strong. Because I've already declared strength, but if he doesn't say it, he cannot receive it. Salvation is only accessible by your confession. Amen. The Bible says, with the heart a man believes unto righteousness, but with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And so when Jesus is to come, I was sharing with the man on Saturday that for Jesus to come, the Bible says the spirit and the bride need to say, come. Even when Jesus was to be born, do you know that the old, the two elderly people that came to see Jesus after he was born, the Lord granted them longevity as business partners because he wanted them to see the dividend of their investment. They spent all their lives declaring in intercession that the Messiah will be born. When Jesus was to begin his ministry, God also sent another man to go ahead of him called John the Baptist. And what was his mission? John the Baptist's mission was to be the forerunner to prepare the way of the Lord. And how did he prepare the way of the Lord? By making roads. How did he prepare the way of the Lord? Go fund me. How did he prepare the way of the Lord? He wasn't raising money. He wasn't campaigning. He wasn't doing anything. But he was speaking that which the Lord Jesus will do when he comes. He was doing what? He was crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. So the prayer that we're going to say at the end of the day is coming from Matthew chapter 3 verse 3. And what does it say? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 3 verse 3 that for this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah saying the voice of him crying in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight I'm going to give you this thing from two dimensions you see one dimension is in your own personal lives a lot of what is amiss is amiss because you are speaking against what you don't want rather than speaking to life what you desire Many of us are praying for God to keep us from being broke when you should be giving thanks to God who has already given to you everything that pertains to life and godliness. 
Many of us, we mention more in our prayers the diseases of our bodies and the infirmities of the sickness of our minds more than we mention the strength and the deliverance of God. Let me tell you something, folks. We need to fix that by using our mouths to prepare the way of the Lord. Why did the way, need, why did John need to make the way of the Lord straight? Because Jesus, when he came, what did he say? He says that I am the light. Light only travels in a straight line. You know the examples that I've given to you, the day we were having serious challenges with Alan and Matthew, they couldn't do illustrations. Have you been praying for them since then? In fact, Anne sent me a video that we can use in coaching them how to be examples. Well, no, you, did you send it to them? <laughs> you see, there you go. Oh yeah. But then, at the end of the day, the illustration and the message of it we got it, didn't we? That if there is no alignment between your subconscious mind and your conscious mind, you do not receive anything from God. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let not such a man expect to receive anything from God. So heaven had prepared before the foundations of the earth that salvation will come by the blood of the Lamb. But after having done all of that, even making a covenant with Adam and Eve, you know God made a covenant with Adam and Eve that they don't need to worry about Satan. He said the seed of the woman will one day bruise the head of the serpent. Even though the serpent strikes its heel, it's not even going to mean anything. Because the Lord said the serpent will strike the heel, but don't worry, the heel will bruise the head. God had done all of those, but man was still in penury. Man was still suffering in Sodom and Egypt. Under the system of Nimrod, man continued to suffer. And why is that? Because the heart of man was not in alignment with the plan of God, and hence the light of salvation could not travel through. Even though that light's been traveling for thousands of years, it couldn't reach us simply because we're out of whack. And that was why John the Baptist was sent to prepare the way of the Lord by telling the people to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He's telling them, change the way you're thinking. Because if you keep thinking that way, you will not receive that which is coming. So our words have to align with what the word of God has said. And so whatever it is that is bothering you, find out what God said about it and begin to say it because your flesh is in opposition to God. Your flesh wants to complain about what is not right, but the heart of God is speaking what is right. Because if God is inviting us to the table, the ancient have a saying that a child that will sit and dine with the elders must know how to wash his hands like they do. Because if you can wash your hands like the elders, no one's gonna ask you to leave the table. But if you come and you make a mess, they'll be like, who brought this child here? You see you, take him out. But if you can prepare yourself the way they prepare themselves, you will have a place at the table. God is inviting us to come around the table, but he needs you to be in alignment with him. Your conversation has to match the conversation of God. So dimension number one is you need to settle things on your own by speaking the exact words that have come out of the mouth of God. We envy the ministry of Jesus. We all want to be like Jesus, as we should. But what did Jesus say? What did he declare to be the secret of his ministry? He says the words that my father speak, the same say I. He says the things that he does, the same do I. God forgives people, but you don't. God loves people, but you don't. God prays for people, but you don't. And then you want the result of Jesus. God says that he has loved you with an everlasting love, but you tell people, I love you only when you're being nice to me. 
His love is unconditional. Yours has like four pages of disclaimer and then another 14 pages of disclosure before you even start getting into the tenants of the contract. You understand what I mean? And that is the reason why we're not having the result of Jesus. God does not walk by sight. I mean, have you ever seen God stop because of what he's seen? If he doesn't like what he's seen, he calls forth what he wants to see. In the beginning, God saw darkness. If it was you and I, we'd be like, oh my goodness, this darkness is ridiculous. Darkness, can you please go so that we can get to, you know, do whatever we want to do? Your, your words will keep saying darkness. And every time you mention darkness, you give life to the darkness. Because life is in your mouth. So when God came, he saw that darkness was upon the face of the deep because he's God who made the eyes. He's not blind. And his Holy Spirit came and it was hovering over the face of the water. And God was like, he never said, let the darkness go away. He said, first of all, let there be light. And there was light. So the deal really is, are you speaking light? Are you speaking life? If we don't operate as Jesus operates, we cannot ride in his army. He's coming with millions in his entourage and they're moving very furiously. When Jesus is riding into victory, the speed of his coming is such that if you don't have eyes, you can't see him. The Bible says a bruised reed, he will not break. A smoking flask, he will not quench until he has ridden justice to victory. How does he do that? Speed. It's like when you have a cup of water on a table and that cup of water is resting on a tablecloth. If you are moving that tablecloth little by little, you will spill the water. But if you pull that tablecloth cloth fast enough, the water does not even know that anything happens. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? If you don't know, you need an Instagram account. Because everybody does that on Instagram. And they have millions of views. And I'm like, I am preaching the word of life. And only Manuel Leader likes my post. Maybe I need to get some tricks too. And then once they click on the little trick, then they can see that, okay, he's preaching the gospel. I've seen people try that. And guess what happens? It doesn't work. The people are only still liking the joke that you're cracking. But when you look at the people listening to them, from the comment, you can tell that the word that the man is trying to preach after the joke is not getting to them because they're still as yuck mouth as they were when they came. But then at the end of the day, the speed with which Jesus is coming requires a lot of precision. And how do we attain that precision? Precision, we need to be able to speak the exact same words that he is speaking. So I want to encourage you today. Be ready to renew your mind and to also renew your speech. Let me tell you, let me share with you one little secret. I think I've mentioned it here before. The order of repentance is this. Paul speaking, he said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. You know many at times we think it's the other way around. That if I think about it long enough, I will understand it. And once I've understood it, I would then say something. That is how professors operate and that is the reason why they don't know anything. You understand what I mean? The secret to having full repentance begins with confession. Because Paul said, I spoke, I understood, and then I thought. If you want to think like God thinks, begin to say what God says. If you want to understand the ways of God, begin to do what? To declare his word. If you don't understand how God takes a man that has been written off by the world and makes an evangelist out of him. Begin to read out loud the account of Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. The understanding that you seek will come. Let me tell you something. The way that understanding comes 
is by speaking. The Bible says the entrance of your word brings light and it brings understanding. If you want to understand the word of God, if you want to understand the mysteries that are on the pages of the Bible and the scriptures that are in your library, you need to begin to read them out loud. You need to begin to speak the word. Joshua chapter one verse eight says, the book of the law shall not depart from where? Your mouth is not supposed to, it's not from your speaker. Because you know what a lot of us do is we play audio Bible. Your speaker will make heaven before you. God forbid, but your speaker is the, your, your little airport or whatever they use at home. What, what's that other thing again? Alexa speaker. Those things, they are speaking the word on your behalf. And you think that's fine. It is good for you to remember the word of God, for you to memorize, for you to meditate, but it is not a substitute for your confession. I was getting comfortable recently playing those things and the Holy Spirit said to me, he said, so when you're done, you need to read it. I want to hear it. I thought I had gotten away with it because you go through scriptures like that. I would even put it on like 1.5, two, two times the speed. You, yeah, we all do that. It's not just you. Yeah, you do like two times the speed. So it's, you're going through scriptures like that. To read the book of Psalms from beginning to the end is about five hours. Right, if you're speaking it at normal speed, but if you, if you condense it by twice the speed, do you know you can listen to the entire book of Psalms in two hours and some? Just about the time it took Charles to get here as he was sitting in traffic, he could have gone through the, and that is the longest chapter in the Bible. You understand what I'm saying? So, but guess what? Just even you, you can do it. You don't have to kill yourself and do it in five hours. But you know that on some Sundays, because you know we, we don't meet on Sundays, or maybe on one of those days off from work, you can just give yourself 12 hours and say, today I will speak out loud everything that is in the book of Psalms. In one day, you can do it. Yeah, that is less than half a season of Stranger Things. Oh yeah, absolutely. How do I know? I read it online that people actually do something called binging. Oh, my wife is here. Oh yeah, I used to do it too. But let me tell you something. In the same amount of time that it would take you to watch one season of a show, do you know how many promises and how much power is in the book of Psalms? Oh yeah. I'm telling you, I leave scriptures on several nights in the week to play while I am sleeping. But when I wake up, I join my speakers in reciting. I don't let them do it for me because God says it must not depart out of my mouth. But you know how the devil has found ways of making us feel complacent and comfortable. The word sacrifice means that which comes from your lips. So here is the deal, y'all. The voice of him crying in the wilderness prepared the way of the Lord. God is recruiting once again his forerunners. We're excited through the instrumentation of revelation and divine prophetic insight at the things that are about to happen in the world. But God is not just going to let you be a spectator in the kingdom. He wants you to be a participant in what he is doing. And the way you are going to participate is to help in preparing the way of the Lord and to make it straight. Last night, or more like in the early hours of this morning, my heart was deeply broken because the Lord gave me insight. You know, sometimes as an intercessor, when you're getting too complacent, God will give you a vision and let you see people where they truly are. And when I saw certain people, there were people, some of them were people that I know, some of them I don't know them personally, but when I saw them in the realm of the spirit, I recognized them. And you know what they were doing? They tied themselves to demonic forces and they were encouraging one another saying, we're just going to follow them wherever they lead. Those demons did not tie them. They were the ones who tied themselves to those forces. Some old rickety people who could barely walk themselves. Don't be surprised the reason why many leaders in the world are becoming aged today. 
is a reflection of what is going on in the spirit. A lot of the principalities and powers that have troubled the world themselves have become tired because the strength they have been using was given by God and it had a time lap. It's got a time expiration on it. So I saw old rickety spirits that could barely walk and they were moving and people tied themselves to these forces, allowing themselves willingly to be led astray. And I wanted to cry. You know, my first thought was I was going to go outside because I felt like it was breezy outside and I'm just going to go outside and cry properly. Because that was how I felt. My heart was that broken for them. And the Lord said to me, I don't want you to cry and I don't want you to be angry. I just need you to pray. I'm like, okay. If that's what it is. Pray we will. And I tell you what's going on. Let me show you two things very quickly. One of them is in the book of Hosea. Come with me to the book of Hosea chapter 2. This is something the Lord was speaking to me about. But I didn't quite get it. Until today. I, I got it, but I got it even better today. And what had happened was my mom called me and she was like, oh, I need to say happy birthday to William because it's William's birthday today. I said, well, I'm doing school runs now. When I get back, you can say happy birthday to him. And I thought she was going to say, okay, call me when you get home. But she just immediately switched. I had to look at my phone because there are times when she, her voice would change and I know that it's a message for me. So I looked at my phone. I saw on her face that, okay, this is now, we're getting into the prophetic. And she began to speak to me about some of the things that the Lord's been speaking to her. She said, God's giving me two critical messages. I am writing them down. But she knows that I don't usually read her, uh, her, her blogs. My mom, she blogs scriptures every day to groups of people on, on, on WhatsApp. But she knows I don't read it. So sometimes she will call me and actually tell me. And so this time around, she was like, the Lord showed me this in the book of Hosea. When she read it to me, I said, do you know that God has been speaking to me about this? And I've been looking for a way to share it with people. So let me show you. Hosea chapter 2. If you can't find Hosea in your Bible... It means you need more practice. Or some people call it Jose, but it's Hosea. Hosea. And now look at what it says. In verse 21, Hosea chapter 2, verse 21. Interesting scripture. You see, one of the prophecies of Enoch, in, this is one of the prophecies of Enoch. Okay, even though most people don't give that credit to Enoch, but it's okay, we know. Because he was the one who introduced us to the concept in detail of why God made man. Right? God made man to be what? To be a farmer. When God made man, he put him in a garden and he told him to tend the garden. That is your mission. But don't stop at the garden. I'm going to give you a wife. And the two of you, you will be fruitful, you will multiply, and then you will replenish the surface of the whole earth. What does the word replenish mean? It means to restore a thing to an originally intended state. So God gave them the sample of what he wants the entire earth to be. A garden that had fruit trees that produce. You understand what I mean? That was why God made man. And God calls himself the husband man. He calls himself a farmer too. You see, farming includes animal husbandry as well, shepherding flock. So God intended for man to be what? To be a farmer. And that's why I'm love, I love the fact that I live in the state of Georgia because the word Georgia means a farmer. So if you know somebody who is George and they buy everything from the store, tell them to live up to their names. They're supposed to be farmers. And so the intention of God originally was for man to farm the earth and bring the produce to give glory to God. Does it make sense now the reason why God was angry with Cain? Because that was one of the most important things and he didn't take it seriously. And God is like, okay, if you can't get this one thing, why are you here? Even though the ground's been cursed for your sake, so, still give it your best shot. And when Jesus comes, he will make all things new. 
One of the things that Enoch saw was that the Messiah came and he made all things new and the earth was once again producing to its full strength. And the Lord was pleased at the heaps of grain and all the baths of oil. Anyway, look at it right here. You don't even have to go and look at any other scripture at this moment. Just look right here. In Hosea chapter 2 verse 21, the Bible says, It shall come to pass in that day that I will answer, says the Lord. I will answer the heavens. And they shall answer the earth. And what's going to happen to the earth? Verse 22, the Bible says the earth shall answer with grain, with new wine, and with oil. They shall answer Jezreel. If you have a good Bible, in, the, in your Bible, the word Jezreel should have a footnote. Let me see your hand if there's a footnote in your Bible for the word Jezreel. Okay. Now, the people who translated this originally did not understand what they were reading. Because if they understood what they were reading, God is talking about a cycle. It starts with me, but it ends with me because the Bible says he's the beginning and the end. God is the cause and the effect of life. Okay, he's the beginning and the end. So when he said, I will answer heaven, and heaven will answer the earth. The earth will answer with what we intended it to be in the first place, a place of production of grain, of wine, and of oil, and it will answer to who? To Jezreel. And you're wondering, this Jezreel must be so important that everything that is happening in heaven and on earth is so that they can produce and give it to Jezreel. But when you look at the footnote in your Bible, what does it say? Jezreel is another name for God. It means the God who sows. The word Jezreel means the Jehovah or the Lord God who sows. He is the one who planted everything and he needs to get, come on, if you are a farmer, if you've ever planted anything, do you want to plant it so that somebody else can come and take it? No, you plant it for yourself. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, even the cattle that is upon a thousand hills. So the Lord is just real. That's his name. He is the Lord that sows. He says, but I will first of all answer heaven and heaven will answer the earth and the, answer will, the earth will answer with what? With grain, with wine and with oil and all of that will answer back to me, the one who planted it in the first place. I am Jezreel, the God who sows. Folks, we were made by God to be his co-laborers. He made everything. He made the earth. He made the seed. He made the tree. And it's like, now the baton is now over to you. Run with it. But then everything ends back right here. That is the reason why when it was all said and done in the book of Revelations, the Bible says that the angels, and in particular, the 24 elders, they cast their crowns aside. All you know, these crowns are great. We thank you for glorifying us, for saving us by the blood of the Lamb. But we know the reason why you made us and saved us is because all glory, honor, and power needs to be given to you, the one who created all things for his pleasure. Does it make sense now the reason why? The new age philosophy is that you are the God. Isn't that what people say now? I even heard the podcast presenter who calls himself the God. And I'm like, people play too much. Because the Bible says God speaking. He says, I am God and there is no other. I don't know, I don't care how funny you want to be. There, are set, there should be limits to things. The Bible says for every idle word that men speak, they will give an account for it. Because we don't know, we trivialize what it takes for us to be able to speak. We are the only creature that God made and gave the power of speech to. Because speech is a function of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says God made all the animals from the earth. And it was like, come on, start walking. Start running around, start barking, start cooing, start mooing. But when he made man, he breathed his own spirit into man. And that is the reason why man can talk. So 
every idle word that you speak, you will give an account because you are wasting power. The power that made everything that you see, God gave it to you. You're a custodian of the power of creation. The Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. By him all things were made and there was nothing made that was made without the word. And God gave you that same power. This thing has come around full circle. What I want you to take out of this place today, especially as we pray, is to begin to show appreciation for the divine power that God has vested in you so that you can genuinely be a co-laborer with him. God gave you the access to come to the secretariat where he does his work so that you can badge in and out as you like as a partner in God's business. And the way you do that is by the word of his power that is being replicated upon your lips. Because if you and I do not not declare the coming of the Lord. You know, it was about three years ago the Lord revealed to me. He says, I am God. Everything that I have said will come to pass. I sit in eternity and I make everything beautiful in its time. It is up to you to speed up the return of the Messiah because if you don't speak the right things, he will not show. God's word will still come to pass because that is the reason why the angels don't even know the day that Jesus is coming back. So you cannot say, God, but you said Jesus is coming on May 10th. So I'm not going to say anything until May 9th. If you don't say anything until May 9th, Jesus may not come until October 12th because he never said he was coming at a particular time. The ball is in your court and God cannot be found blame. God is blameless. So you cannot find him guilty. So let us quit playing games and start speaking the word of life. So this is the reason why we were made. But the one thing or the other thing that I want you to take out of this place today is God, the Bible says, first of all, answered the heavens and then the heavens answered the earth. Do you know what it means for God to answer the heavens? There are two groups of people in heaven right now that are waiting for God's attention. They are waiting for God's instruction. They are waiting and they're like, okay, God, we're waiting. We've been waiting for thousands of years and you're still busy. You're, doing, you're being God. But we need you to answer us. Group number one, the matters, the saints that have died. The Bible says from the altar that is in the presence of God, from underneath the altar, come the voices of the saints, the ones who have given their lives in sacrifice, in pursuit of the spread of the gospel. They are crying out to God and saying, how much longer shall we wait until you avenge our blood on our enemies, even the enemies of your truth? So those people are crying. And then the other group of people that are crying are the, is the order of the archangels. The archangels were there when Adam and Eve fell. And that was when they began their intercession because they could not understand how such a glory would be reduced to that. They saw Adam and Eve when Adam and Eve could see them even from right inside of the garden. And they've been interceding from there. And they're waiting for God to answer them. Do you know what the saints and the angels are going to do when God answers them? Because Jesus is the answer. The moment they see that God has commissioned for Jesus to start coming to the earth, they will come too. And I'm going to explain that very quickly so that you understand what I am saying. The Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first. And they will be in the company of the saints as he comes to the earth. Who else is going to be in that company? The archangel of the Lord Michael mobilizes his own angels. Because they have been interceding and interceding and they just want God to answer so that intercession can stop and possession can begin. Or the procession can begin. The possession of the earth is going to come right after the touch ground. But they want to begin their procession. If you read the book of Daniel chapter 12, the Bible says that the archangel Michael is watching the earth and his heart is broken because he sees such tribulation upon the earth as has never been seen. And this is the same angel of the Lord that is called the intercessor of the people of God. And who leads all of that intercession? The saints are praying. The angels are praying. But who is the leader of intercession in heaven? The Lord Jesus himself. He says, I am going. 
to prepare a place for you. And he's not preparing that place by punching things on the keyboard. The Bible says he forever lives to make intercessions for the sons of men. So God is about to answer heaven. And heaven will answer the earth. But when heaven answers the earth, the prayer that they are praying, you know what it looks like from my perspective? <laughs> God is very interesting. You see, all that prayer that they're saying, they're saying for you and I, it looks like an act of love. But by the time that prayer shows up on the earth, it's a bowl. And it's the bowl of wrath. When it gets here, it will burn. <laughs> this is the reason why you need to pray. Because when you begin to intercede like they are interceding, their prayer will not become wrath where you're at. It's going to become help and grace where you're at. Because by engaging them and being in sync with them, you are able to replicate exactly their experience as opposed to the wrath that it brings. Let me prove that to you more clearly. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 and 8. Alan is excited now. Because on Saturday, I said, we're going to read Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 and 8. And before we got there, I switched it to Romans. And I believe the Romans blessed our hearts. But he said, I went home and the Lord led me to read the Revelation 12 anyway. And it was exactly the message you had just preached. 14. Yeah, I actually have it open as 14, but for some reason I love 12. Thank you, Alan. So this is what it says, Revelation 14, verses 7 and 8. It says, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. What did I tell you about the water that is in heaven? If you don't go to the spring and you let the water come to you, it comes in as judgment. Right? You just read it here. It is judgment upon the sea. The sea is the generality of the people. But the people who approach it, who engage it by being in the presence of God, what does it become to them? The same judgment, it becomes a spring of life to them. When Jesus comes, the same Jesus that will burn all of the works of iniquity, all of the things that the world's been sowing, they will reap their own harvest in the form of fire and judgment. But you will reap yours in the form of grain, of wine, and of what? And of the oil. That is the reason why when the angels of death, remember the four living creatures, when they proclaim the judgment of God, it caused the release of the four angels that are holding the wings of destruction in the corners of the earth. We'll call them the four horsemen of the apocalypse. When the four horsemen of the apocalypse were being released, what did God say? God says, remember, do not hurt the oil and the wine. <laughs> you see, God wants to preserve your reward. But the only way your reward is going to be preserved is if you preserve your life. And the only way you are going to preserve your life, the Bible says the word of God is a well of living water and it preserves the soul of the righteous. These are the times wherein, come on, praise the Lord, I think that is great news. Study the word. Speak the word. And once you're done, pray until you can pray no more and then start studying the word again. Because there is nothing else. Every other thing is Martha ministry. Running around. But Jesus says that is futility. Mary has chosen the right thing which is to sit at the foot of the word of God. When you study the word of God a lot, praying for hours will not be an issue because you have things to say. So we're going to get up now by the grace of God and we're going to pray as we break bread. And we're going to pray every one of those things, but in particular, we will pray Matthew chapter 3, verse 3. So let me remind you of what is going on and the times that we have come to. We have come to a time wherein God is saying it's time. In fact, for the benefit of, of Chris and his wife, because they were not here when I taught from Daniel chapter 12, I will just read a couple of things to you from Daniel chapter 12. 
And what does it say? It says, at that time, which time? Hosea chapter 2, verse 21, when God answers, answers the heavens. Heaven is on hold, waiting for God to answer. The next time God answers heaven, well, this is what's going to happen. They're coming down. They are riding into victory. And so the Bible says, and at that time, Michael shall stand up. The great prince who stands watch. To stand watch is an ancient term for to intercede. Because the word intercession, how do we describe it? We call it standing in the gap. All right? He stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was seen. Since, such as never was seen there was a nation. Even to that time, and at that time, your people shall be delivered. Praise the Lord. Everyone who's found written in the book of life. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life, whilst others to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, this is the reason why you need to pray. The Bible says those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. If you are wise, you will pray. You want me to prove that to you? You already know. The five foolish virgins and the five, five wise virgins. What was the difference? The oil in their lamp was symbolic of prayer. Because Jesus was speaking to a people who prayed with a prayer lamp. The, the Israelites that Jesus was speaking to at the time, even the order of the Pharisees that were overhearing what he was saying, they, whenever they wanted to pray, what did they do? They first of all light a lamp to pray. Okay, if you don't know the reason why they light a lamp to pray, it's because a lot of their prayers were written down and if they were praying at night, there's no way they can see it without having a prayer lamp, okay? So don't be thinking there's anything else other than that because somebody recently gave me one of, somebody gave me an ancient prayer lamp and I've not had to use it because I live in America. There's always light. You understand what I mean? You think she might be watching? Oh yeah, no, it's, it's beautiful. It's a wonderful decoration where I put it. I've just not been, I've not, I've not had need for it. And they gave me a whole jug of oil to go with it. I think it's probably from Bethlehem or something like that. Really special present. And I'm like, oh, this is amazing. Thank you. I smiled from here to here. And when they were gone, I'm like, not going to use it? I don't pray that I would need to use it because for me to use it means there is no Georgia power. Light. You see what I mean? But when Jesus was speaking to them, there was no electricity. At least there was, but they weren't using it yeah. to light up their rooms. They were using it for other things. Yeah. But guess what? So Jesus said to them, they didn't have lamp. That means they were not praying. And that was why afterwards, what did he tell them? He said to them, watch and pray. You need light to watch. You need light to pray. And so if you are wise, what does it mean? It means that you're praying. Because the people that are coming to you to rescue you and to transform you are intercessors. And they're coming to join with their teammates on the earth. If they come and you're a glutton who is always feasting on the pleasures of life rather than making time to do spiritual things, they will pass you by because they don't know you. Depart from me. You workers of iniquity because I do not know you. I'm encouraging you because of the fact that to whom much is given, much is expected. I'm telling you there were people who raised us in ministry, who have since gone to heaven, who wish they could be alive today. It's never been easier than it is today to pray because the heavens have been kept open for so long. And in the season that we're in, there are people here who, are can, who can attest to what I'm saying. If you can't attest to it just yet, I'm begging you, dive into it. Was it the men that I was telling on Saturday about the, 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 the prayer of the midnight? You see those hours between 12 a.m. and 3 a.m.? 
Wake up. Go to bed early. If you don't watch that TV show, you will not die but live. Go to bed early if you're not like those who can stay up late. Or if you don't have the allowance to do so, if you have to get up to, to, to get children ready for school, sleep early when the children sleep. And then you wake up in the middle of the night. Don't even pray for those three hours at the beginning. Try one. That was Jesus' recommendation. He says, watch with me an hour. And those are the hours of watch. So if you're struggling to pray, pray during the day, maybe your spirit is trying to tell you, look, sleep now. It'd be more effective if we did it in the middle of the night. This season that we have come to is so easy. Why does God make it easy? Because that is what he expects you to be doing. You think you're expecting God to give you lots of money to go shopping? And God is like, I don't even want to do that now because that would distract you from your real assignment. You know, many of us are praying for our ex-boyfriends to take us back. And God is like, no, I don't want him to take you back because he would take you back. Did you get what I did just then? Take you back, then they will take you back. And God wants you to step forward and focus on him. So that your entire body can be full of light. The Bible says those who are white will shine as the stars of the firmament. Oh, I wish I could teach you the physics of the stars tonight. But one day we're going to get to it. You see, because what will cause those ones to shine as the firmament is because of the immense energy that is coming in the company of innumerable angels. If you're made of the same material, it is called quantum. It will activate you wherever you're at. But if you're not postured right, you will not have the inductivity to be able to engage the power with which they come. I tell you what, somebody, we will be transfigured here upon the earth when the Lord Jesus comes. And that is the way it's going to happen. Oh, See. So let's pray Matthew chapter 3 verse 3. Hallelujah. Oh, in fact, well, that one we have already read it. Let's read something fresh that is very similar. Jeremiah chapter 16. We're going to read verse 2. Jeremiah 16 verse 2. What does it say? It says, You shall not take a wife, nor shall you have sons or daughters in this place. For thus says the Lord concerning the sons and the daughters who were born in this place and concerning their mothers who, were, who bore them and their fathers who begot them in this land. They shall die gruesome deaths. They shall not be lamented, nor shall they be buried, but they shall be like refuse on the face of the earth. They shall be consumed by the sword and by famine and their corpses shall be meat for the birds of heaven and for the beasts of the earth. The Lord is saying, the people of that land, that is what's about to happen to them. But you, the Bible says you need to come out from among them and be separate. What is coming, uh, I keep saying that sometimes it may sound like I'm a prophet of doom, but that is to the people who do not understand the workings of heaven. The same thing that is causing you to light up as the firmament is this same tribulation that Angel Michael was talking about and he revealed to Daniel in Daniel chapter 12 that we've just read. Tribulation such as the earth has never seen. Do you know that we've had several wars? We've had world wars and what would happen after a world war? You would have mass burial grounds. They would bury people in mass. That is terrible. That is bad. But what is coming is worse because the people will not even be buried. Oh, It's not me. It's the word of God. You understand what I mean? And that is the reason why the Bible says there's never been such a tribulation since time was. Since there was time. We've never seen a thing like that. But guess what? We have also never seen the kind of glory. Do you know that? All through biblical records that we have, there's never been a time wherein there were more than two or three people transfigured at the same time in the same place. 
Adam and Eve, they were made in a transfigured state. That was why they didn't need any robes to cover them because they were covered in the light of God's glory. When Jesus appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses and Elijah, all three of them were transfigured together. When the apostles on the, on the, in the upper room received the Holy Spirit, it wasn't even a full transfiguration because it was, the, it was the flame that was seen upon their heads, but their countenance was pretty much still the countenance of a man. But guess what's going to happen at this final appearing? We all who are named by the name of God, who are the wise ones, will all be transfigured. And there will be hundreds of millions of us and we will light up at the same time. They made a movie about it on Netflix. You can go and look at it. It's called... It's the title is the title of a passage in the Bible, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, manifest. Yeah, yeah, manifest. You see the way that they were lighting up? Yeah, and that's the reason why they, if, you, if you watch the entire thing, you see that it's based on scriptures. They're just weaving parables into one another. It's called manifest. And the reason why I watched it, I was sitting down and the Holy Spirit said to me, watch this show. I said, manifest. And I saw a plane in the background. It looks like the list of people. And it says, yes, manifest there represents the book of life because there is a manifest coming out of heaven. Oh, praise the Lord. But it's also for the manifestations of the sons of God. So we will pray tonight before we leave here as we break bread that these three things that we have been told that first of all, we will not fall for the deception of Satan by giving glory to another, we'll give all the glory to God. So when people around you want to blame government, let them blame government, you give glory to God. Amen. When people around you want to blame, you know, corporations, oh, look at what they've done to people. I say this today, Brother Matthew, you already know what is coming. I say this today, why? Because things are about to begin happening on the earth that men have not seen before, but they want to blame somebody else. Satan is waiting for that. He wants the glory. We will not let him have it. It's the Lord's doing. And it is for the sake of the elect. So what is the second thing that I talked about? God is looking for partners who will speak to help prepare the way of the Lord. Are you ready to begin to speak the mind of God? The Lord said to me very clearly, as clear as you can hear me, he said to me, he says, the ones who are ready to partner with me, I will equip beyond their wildest imagination. God wants to, because this, if we don't use the power now, we don't need it anymore. No, we don't. When we get into the new Jerusalem, the Bible says Jesus will be the light in the midst of us. We will have energy more than, the, more than a thousand suns. Living with us, we are constantly powered. We don't need any more power. There's no sin. Satan would have been held bound and thrown into the bottomless pit. Even the beast that came from the abyss that overpowered the witnesses would have also been put in chains. So you don't need the power. So all the power that has ever been promised and planned and reserved is for now. This is the final blow. And we have to be ready to be God's battle axis. And so the third thing is this. Having known that the wise ones are the ones that will be illuminated while the foolish ones are getting executed. The Bible says that their work will be burnt and even they will be consumed. So if it takes being wise to make it, Lord, help me to walk in your wisdom. Help me to be an intercessor. Help me to pray and not to faint. Help me to look at you and not at me. Because I am signing up to be the voice of him crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. As we break bread today, I want to encourage you with your own mouth to make a fresh commitment to the Lord. To say, Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you for calling me. Thank you for the Lord Jesus, who is my ultimate example. And thank you, Lord, for this reminder word today. To say that you're looking for witnesses. That you're looking for partners. I am saying, Lord, here I am. Send me. The call was taken from the altar to purify the mouth of Isaiah. And I say to you today that in the mighty name of Jesus, that your tongue will be purified so that you can begin to speak life, speak truth, and speak grace, even graciously in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for the body of Jesus that was broken for us. 
Thank you for the blood of Jesus that was shed for us as we eat of his body today and drink of his blood in remembrance of him. May we, Lord, be one step closer to being transfigured here upon the earth. May we, Lord, get closer to you and not to anything else that leads astray. But let us remain in your pursuit. Let us remain, Lord, in your wake. Let us remain, Lord, in your trail. Let us remain pursuing after you in righteousness and your co-laborers in the mighty name of Jesus. I want to say this. Let me tell you something. There is an authority that works by legality. Let me explain. Jesus says, I want you to forgive people. But there are people who don't believe that it's possible for one man to forgive another. So he says that you may know that the Son of Man has the power to forgive sins. He said to the crippled man, stretch forth your hand. And a creative miracle happened. We don't need that creative miracle to repeat itself for us to know what Jesus said. He was letting us know that he has given us such authority. And it's a legal authority because Jesus paid the price for it. And so that authority is very active because I've seen it in my life. So I declare by the authority of fruitfulness and divine accomplishment that every fog that keeps you from understanding the word of God be lifted. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray also that every restless feet that cannot sit at the foot of the word of God to be ingested to, to, to be filled, let such feet be rested in the mighty name of Jesus. Every restlessness that keeps taking you like Martha away from the Lord, I declare that over in your life in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I thank you because your word says kind begets kind. Lord, as you have given me that divine enablement to seek after your word, let everyone here today begin to hunger and thirst for your word in a way that they haven't before. And Lord, as they do, let the heavens open even more to them, that they may hear your voice telling them this is the way. I pray for you especially today because we need that in order to fulfill our assignment. We need that rest and that focus and that attentiveness to the word of God. It is part of our assignment. It is part of our equipping. It is part of our privilege. Let it be so unto you in the mighty name of Jesus. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood. Alan, when you have, can you please come and let me hold this microphone for a moment? Michelle, can I pray? Um, I'm going to pray for you, but then at the same time, I'm using you as a point of contact. So if you could just come. This is something the Lord revealed to me, and we're just going to do this one more thing before we close today. The Lord said to me that the ears of those children that have been blocked will open. I see several children that have been instructed in the things of righteousness, but they're not listening because of the noise of the world and because of the lust of their own flesh. And from this moment onwards, you will begin to register change in your homes. For sons and daughters, for nephews and nieces, for grandsons and granddaughters, for students in your classroom, for adopted ones and of for beloved ones, you will begin to register divine change because now their ears have been opened. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, as you showed to me, do I. Be opened in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. Lord, we give you praise. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. Why don't we just for a moment, let's just pace back and forth before the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. And let us just give God thanks. Just thank God wherever you are. And just say, Father, I thank you for this moment. I thank you for the divine enablement. I thank you for divine empowerment. I thank you because I'm no longer a slave to sin, but I am a slave to righteousness. I am no longer bound by my own weakness, but I've been set free to enjoy the strength of, that is available by the grace of God. Father, thank you for this invitation to come closer, to come up higher. Thank you for this invitation to be partners with you in righteousness, to be 
we call laborers with you father thank you because you are calling for the voices of them that will cry in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord and to make straight the path of the Messiah Lord I thank you for my privilege with much privilege however comes great responsibility I will not fail in my responsibility to do your will to encourage others to edify the body and for the perfection of the saints in the mighty name of Jesus Holy Ghost we thank you Father we worship your holy name in the mighty name of Jesus praise the Lord hallelujah praise God praise God praise God praise God hallelujah okay I want to give you an assignment I'm going to give you a simple one alrighty I want to give you an assignment I'm going to give you a very simple one three things I know that many of you haven't even done the last assignments that I gave you but for the ones who have I'm obliged to continue to give you assignments I want you to go and write down for yourself you're not going to present it here but write it down three things that God has delivered you from three things <laughs> somebody says just three I know <laughs> <laughs> in, in fact, initially I wanted to say I wanted to say 14. So if you want to go up to 14, you can. But write down three things that God delivered you from and ask him why. You will hear things that you did not know. Many of you gave yourself reasons. You thought this was why God delivered you from those things. But he wants to tell you why he really did so that your appreciation for his love and his hand in your life can go through the roof because you need that sense of appreciation. This was the way the Lord said it to me many years ago. The Lord said to me that an attitude of gratitude is the key to an altitude of beatitudes. If you want to press into the fullness of the blessings of the kingdom, you need to be grateful. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Alan. Yes, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. What a word. What a word. If I, my brother will help us with the offering slide, we'll go ahead and give and worship for what the Lord has done. What a great reminder because so many times when we go before the Lord, we declare what we want to be saved from, all the issues that we see in our life, but it's time to start declaring His promises in our situation. Hallelujah. So we have our tithing offering slide up. If you need an envelope, we have them here. To the left of me, we'll go ahead and get started. If you haven't given yet, we'll give you a couple more seconds. Father, we give you praise. There's none like you. Ha tarabasu. O sadibakaka. Hallelujah. If you have your offering with you or you've already given, let's go ahead and just lift it up to the Lord. Oh God, we thank you. And we say there's none like you. We give you praise because your word declares that you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Lord, your word declares that you multiply us, O oh God, and bless us. Father, we thank you so much for the seed that you indeed have provided us, O oh God, and we give it back unto you, O oh Lord. Let these tithes and offerings be pleasing in your sight. Lord, we thank you for this season that you bring us into, O oh God, lifting us up for your glory, for you to be glorified. Lord, all glory and honor belong to you. Jehovah Jireh, there's none like you. Lord, we praise you. Amen. All righty. Y'all know we got worship gathering Saturday coming up, but just tomorrow, you know, we're going to be tapping into prayer every Wednesday. Instagram, 9 p.m. Come, press in with us. We're going to pray in the Holy Ghost as the Lord has been leading us. So much revelation has come from that. And so I really just want us to be charged in our prayer. Father, we give you praise. We thank you so much for this time of ministry, of impartation, of deliverance, oh God. Lord, we say we love you. We say we thank you, oh God. Now, Lord, take us by the hand. Let us walk step in step. 
oh God, hand in hand with you. Lord, we love you. We say we love you so much. But Lord, we thank you for loving us first, for seeing us first, oh God, for choosing us first. Lord, we declare again that all glory belong to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All righty. Everyone have a blessed week.